One of the ways that we can classify animals, or at least talk about different characteristics that they share, is looking at their germ layers. And you're probably like, I have no idea what that is. So let's go ahead and jump in. So what a germ layer is, and I'm trying to make this as simple as possible. So if you're like, well, actually I'm an embryologist and this is really what it is. Yeah, I get it. So you think about you, think about yourself as an embryo, but really any animal, not just, just humans, but think about humans. When you are only a couple of hundred of cells, what's really cool is that our cells, despite only being a hundred and Oh God, uh, 124, 54, whatever. When you're a couple hundred cells, your cells are turning on different series of genes. And some of those genes help to assign the cells of what that cell is going to make in life. Bam, germ layer. So here's what I mean by that. So if you take a look at this picture, here you are, just a clump of cells, and then you start forming like this little indentation. Remember we talked about our protostomes and deuterostomes, that in, in, um, indentation, thinking about maybe your anus, maybe your mouth, depends on who you are. Anyway, your cells start differentiating themselves. A series of cells in this example, a series of cells, these blue ones are going to be the outside of your body. The ones in green, they're going to be the inside of your body. The ones in orange, they're going to be the middle part of your body. And that sounds super simplistic, but kind of at the end of the day, that's exactly what's happening. We're going to talk more about the specifics of this in a moment, but the germ layers are referring to those layers of cells. When you are only a couple hundred of cells large, those layers of cells and what they're going to become later on in life. So we'll kind of just stick with that. So as an organism, as an animal, you can be classified simply by how many germ layers do you have? So one classification are organisms that are diploblasts. So di, D-I means two. So diploblasts have two germ layers. The first layer is the endoderm. So endo means inside. Derm is referring, um, it gets referred to as skin, um, but it really kind of means more of um, like a surface, but we'll use skin for simplicity. So it means in inner skin or the inner layer. So when this jellyfish is only a couple hundred cells, when it starts forming these germ layers, the inside layer of those uh, of that germ layer called the endoderm, eventually those cells are going to give rise to the lining of the digestive system, lining of the respiratory tract, uh, lining to the internal part of that organism. The other germ layer that diploblasts have are the ectoderm, ecto referring to outer layer. So again, you're only a couple hundred cells and the outermost layer, that outermost germ layer, when you're only a couple hundred cells, eventually gives rise to the outer epithelial cells. Also gives rise to things like the nervous system, um, which is heavily entwined, uh, entwined with those outer epithelial cells. So it's giving rise to the outside of the body. So again, as a diploblast, those are the only two layers you have. You have the endoderm on the inside. In this jellyfish picture, that's this yellowy area. And you have the ectoderm, which is the blue area or the outside. Again, that endoderm and ectoderm are present as an embryo, and they're just giving rise to those cells as you grow and mature. Jellyfish are actually one of the very few organisms that are diploblasts. Most other organisms are triploblasts, meaning they have three. Tri means three, so three germ layers. They've got an endoderm, just like we saw in our jellies. Just like in our jellies, this is the outer, or sorry, inner layer, of your couple hundred cells. This is what's gonna give rise to the linings of the digestive tract and the respiratory tract. But before we get to the ectoderm, there's a third layer. And that third layer is referred to as the mesoderm. Meso referring to middle. The mesoderm is essentially giving rise to like everything in your body. So connective tissues, particularly 
Connective tissues include things um, like muscles and blood and bones and organs and just general connective tissue. Like it's pretty much giving rise to not your skin, not your nervous system, and not the internal linings of your organs. So pretty much everything else. And then similarly to our diploblast, we also have an ectoderm, that outermost layer that is going to develop into the outer epithelial cells. This is a picture of a flatworm. We're going to explore flatworms later on um, in this unit, but showing a cross section, blue is that outer epithelial, that would have been the ectoderm. The yellow uh, is the endoderm, the internal digestive tract, and then the orange or all the connective tissues giving, um, having the mesoderm gave rise to um, all of those structures in the middle. So in that kind of orangey pinkish color. So triploblasts and diploblasts aren't that different from each other. It's just the triploblasts have one more fully developed layer, germ layer. Now we're going to dive in a little bit more to our triploblasts. So pretty much every single organism outside of our jellies and technically our sponges as well are triploblasts. Now, if you're a triploblast, if you have those three layers, Another characteristic about your three layers is a coelom. And I know you're looking at that word, you're like, that's not how you pronounce that, but it is. Uh, so a coelom. And I like to think of a coelom, or it's not me, like what a coelom is, is a body cavity. And this body cavity is where you're finding different organs. Now I'm gonna use humans as an example because you probably understand human anatomy more than tapeworm anatomy and more than like frog anatomy, or maybe not. You're like, actually I've dissected a frog, whatever. So in humans, we're triploblasts. We've got, we've got some ectoderm, we've got some endoderm, we've got some mesoderm, and our um, body is organized to have, we actually have two body cavities. I am using this as an example. You do not need to write down these different body cavities. But we have a thoracic cavity, so our lungs and our heart is found. And if you were to open up our rib cage, there would literally be space. Now that space is filled with fluid, but, but there's literally space as in like you could put your hands in and grab the heart. You could move your hands around the lungs. If you've dissected frogs or pigs before, you've probably actually experienced that. It's not straight 100% tissue, like there's literally space there. The other cavity that humans in particular have and some other animals is we have a, a, a abdominal cavity where our intestines are found, the liver, stomach, and other um, accessory organs. Again, this cavity literally has space. Now it's not open air, there is liquid in there, but it's not straight tissue the entire way. It's not muscle all the way through. It's not organs all the way through. Like there's literally space. This is only because we have a mesoderm. So diploblasts don't have a coelom. Like the, there's no mesoderm to kind of enable the ability for a coelom to form. So, so why do we have a coelom? So there's a couple of different ways or a couple of different benefits to having a coelom. So one, by having this space, like literally open space, your organs can develop fully, grow optimally. A great example of this, I don't know if you guys have ever seen this, and if you haven't, you're gonna be like, what are you talking about? You can buy square watermelons, and the way you buy them, or the way you make them, is that as a watermelon is growing, you put it in a very you put it in a box and the box doesn't move. And so the watermelon starts growing and it growing and it hits the box wall and it stops growing in that direction and starts filling in other areas. That watermelon is confined to that box. Now in organisms that have coelums, our heart grows. And if our heart was being pushed up against um, bones in every direction, if our heart was being pushed up against extra tissue or hard surfaces, our heart would not form correctly. It would be reaching a barrier and being unable to fulfill its potential. And there are heart defects that that's exactly what's happening. By having these cavities, by having this coelom, there's literally space for your organs to grow. They're not hitting a brick wall and they're not being stunted in their growth. 
This also provides cushion, so you can almost think of your thoracic cavity or your abdominal cavity as an airbag. Do not treat it like an airbag. Don't be like, ah, no, I'll be fine, guys. Like, I gotta seal them. It's an airbag. Nope. It's not, um, but you can think of it like one. It's like a very, very uninsulated airbag, but there's extra space there. There's, there's a little bit of room to work with. And then finally, providing more flexibility. Like your organs have space to move so that if you're reaching in weird directions, your intestines aren't getting pinched. There is places for it to go. So I know that was kind of a long little spiel, but... Having a coelom is great. And the reason that your body can have a coelom is because you're a triploblast. You've got mesoderm, you've got connective tissue, you have, not you specifically, but as an embryo, like it has the ability to create a coelom. Now, what I've actually described were organisms that are called eucelomates. That EU root means true. So a eucelomate is a true coelomate. And most triploblasts are eucelomates. So these organisms, like the sheep here, like us humans, were eucelomates. And here's what it actually looks like at the, if we were looking at just the germ layers. So in blue is our ectoderm, yellow is our endoderm. But what we want to focus on is this mesoderm. So organisms that have a true coelom, which is everything I just described, you're going to see mesoderm here along the ectoderm. You're going to see mesoderm here along the endoderm, and, and it's connected. Essentially, you know, it's not like, oh, you peel back our skin and bam, there's your digestive system. No, you peel back the skin, but the skin has fat and has muscle on it. Okay, well, that, that's mesoderm, right? Mesoderm gave rise to that fat and to um, that muscle. Okay, so here's the ectoderm of skin. Peel it back. Here's some mesoderm, skin and muscle. Then you have the coelom. You have this space. You have this space around your heart. And then, okay, well, if you, uh, we'll use uh, stomach because we're thinking about the digestive system. Well, the stomach itself is an organ which came from the mesoderm. So we have our skin, we have our muscle. You peel that back, you have this open cavity of the ab abdominal uh, cavity. And then you have your stomach, which is more mesoderm. And then on the inside of that stomach, your endoderm. Essentially what my point is, is you have ectoderm, you got some mesoderm, you got your space, you got some more mesoderm, and you've got your endoderm. If you look at this opening you see, this opening is representing that coelom or that body cavity. If you look at the opening, that opening has mesoderm all around it, right? The opening right here, it's got mesoderm here, it's got mesoderm here. The opening right here, it's got mesoderm here, it's got mesoderm here, it's got mesoderm everywhere. Most organisms are eucelomates. But of course, it's the animal kingdom. There's always exceptions. So let's talk about those exceptions. The first exception are the pseudo-coelomates. Pseudo meaning false. So we have the eucelomates, those are the true, and pseudocelomates, these are the false coelom. And if you look at the picture, you'd be like, hey, there's a body cavity there. There's an open space. Hey, you open up their skin and bam, there's a space before their heart or before whatever. But it's not quite. So if, if we were to pretend this is a human, Here's that blue ectoderm. You peel back that skin. This orange mesoderm. Okay, you got your muscles there. You've, you, you've got some connective tissue on that skin. You open it up. Okay, bam, body cavity. Internal digestive system. There's nothing protecting that digestive system. There's no connective tissue. There's no fats. There's no tissue. There's no muscle. There's no bone. There's nothing at that digestive system. It's just there. It's almost like free floating in this organism. We only see this in worms. We're going to explore those worms a little bit more later on. But essentially, if you look at this opening, here's this opening. Oh, there's mesoderm on that side. And oh, endoderm here. It is not lined 100% with mesoderm. So again, comparing to eucelomates, let's say I'm right here. To my left is mesoderm. To my right is mesoderm. I go here. To my left is endoderm. 
and to the right is mesoderm. So this body cavity, the open space, the coelom, is not completely encapsulated by mesoderm. This is an exception. And by exception, I just mean there's, there, there's only one group of organisms that are like this. The last group of organisms we'll talk about are the acelomates. These are the organisms that lack a coelom. Now they're still triploblasts. They've got an ectoderm. They've got a mesoderm. They've got an endoderm. They have those three layers. But there's no coelom. There's no body cavity. There's no opening. If you were to cut these kind of worms open, what you would see is, oh, here's their skin. And I'm trying to peel back the skin, but it's really freaking hard because all this muscle and organs and everything is all attached to it. Like everything's attached to each other. It's like slicing into a loaf of bread. I don't know if this is a good analogy or not, but you slice into a loaf of bread and like all it is is, is bread, right? Like that's all that's in there. Um, so you slice into this worm, like all it is is tissue. There's no open space. If this was a human, this would be, oh, you, you cut open the rib cage and one, well, you have a really hard time opening it because there's no space. And when you do open it, it's your heart connected to all this, all this muscle and all these bones and like all this stuff. There'd be no cushion at all. Like we, we would be like a box full of stuff. <laughs> uh, there, there'd be no opening. This similar to pseudocelomates is the exception. There's only one group of organisms that are acelomates. All our triploblasts are eucelomates. We have an exception that are acelomates. We got an exception that are pseudocelomates, but pretty much everything else is a eucelomate because that coelom offers so many evolutionary advantages. Your organs are growing optimally. You have that cushion, you have that flexibility, and that's lending itself to better survival. But these guys still exist, so it's not like they're doomed, uh, but uh, they definitely do have some disadvantages. So again, we're taking a look at the germ layers, which again are, are layers kind of defined when you're only a couple hundred cells that are going to be the cells that are going to develop into the outer skin, that are going to be the cells that develop into your digestive system. And depend we can classify animals depending on how many germ layers they have. And then essentially, how are those germ layers arranged to create a body cavity or not create a body cavity? So now we've gone through all the different ways we can classify animals. This, of course, is not an exhaustive list. There's definitely more characteristics, some of which we're going to explore more as we start diving into these different animal phyla.